you've tuned in to the 49ers Rush Podcast, and here is your host, John Chapman. All right, 49ers, we a uh, rough week again. We come back with a loss to our division rivals off the bye week, which is rough at home. You got to win those, but ah, man, we, this is our ninth straight loss to the damn Seattle Seahawks, which just sucks. But man, they're on a roll. You got to give it to them. Russell Wilson is a beast. But man, this is a game that could have been won. Uh, you changed just a couple key things. It definitely was a winnable game. But we weren't in it late in the fourth quarter just because we didn't capitalize on mistakes. And we'll get through and talk about that. But first, uh, exciting announcement. I am joining forces with a new website, fullpresscoverage.com. And they're going to be hosting the podcast over there and lots of other stuff. And basically what full press coverage is going to be, it's a lot of writers that I've worked with in the past over several different jobs. But um, it's going to be kind of like a one-stop shop. So instead of having like your fantasy website or your team website or your draft website, it's going to have everything all in one. And this is a brand new venture of a whole bunch of sports writers that just wanted to get together and do it right. So the official launch is going to be tomorrow. Monday, probably the same day you're listening to this, and that's just fullpresscoverage.com. It's going to be awesome, so please check them out. Um, I'm going to be putting up lots of stuff there and focusing a lot on draft content in the off season. but for now, uh, I'll be over on the 49ers and the fantasy site, so that's always going to be there, so make sure you go check them out. Now, let's jump into the game, because this game was rough. <laughs> let's just be very, very real. There were so many just easy mistakes that what we did was we just put ourselves in just such a rough rough issue now having said that it was a very rainy and windy game from the start i mean just the opening kickoff fell off the tee as he was kicking it I, i've always wondered what that would look like and they re-kicked it which was great then we kick it out of bounds and it's a huge mistake we give up great field position then we intercept the first play and, and we do nothing with that so it's just Man, we're such a young football team, and it just shows every single week that we have so many negative plays to start a drive, and once we do that, we cannot capitalize and overcome mistakes. We It's, it's a sign of just being a young, inexperienced, non-winning football team. Now, a couple things about our offense before I jump in. They basically decided, the Seahawks, that they were going to crowd the box and basically run a soft zone but with an eight-man box and what that means is there's eight guys very very close to stop the run and as soon as they deem it's a pass they just drop into a soft shell coverage zone cover three zone for the most part and just let you sneak and dunk underneath but they're challenge you on the far throws and man i hate to say it but our scripted play uh, calling was awful to start this game usually that's Kyle Shanahan's strong suit usually a head coach will script anywhere between 12 to 20 plays that you are going to run and you practice that script and practice and so whenever you get out there you have confidence you know what's coming next and all those things well he didn't deviate from that and it cost us big time because they basically we didn't adjust to their game plan until the two minute warning in the first half and we didn't have much success from that now we had one first down in the first quarter which was terrible and we didn't attempt a pass over 15 yards until the second quarter. There were about 12 minutes left in the second quarter was the very first time we threw the ball over 15 yards downfield, and which is exactly what they wanted us to do. They basically said, you guys are not an efficient enough offense to dink and dunk and sustain a drive, and they were correct. And the main reason why is uh, penalties, dropped passes, pass protection errors, things like that. So... As we go through this, just kind of keep that in mind um, as we move forward. Now, let's focus on some bright news. My offensive MVP player is Marquise Goodwin. And the main reason why is he was able to deliver huge big plays downfield, which he's done throughout the NFL season. But above all, he didn't have any drops. He, uh, he had four catches for 78 yards on six targets, and the two targets that he didn't come down with were not his fault. They were didn't even touch his hands. So everything that got close to him, he caught, which is wonderful because he's at about a 50% catch rate on catchable passes, which is absolutely terrible. It's like Dez Bryant bad or Mike Evans bad. Um, those guys are superstars, but they just drop everything. But, hey, absolute great game. He provided us with a huge spark. And on two of our scoring drives, they were because of the big plays that he made. So 
Marquise Goodwin, my MVP, back-to-back great games. Hopefully he can continue rolling with that. Now let's go through and talk about the different players. Let's start with the quarterback position. Number one, C.J. Beathard. Oh, man, let me just say this. I could not respect a guy that plays with more heart and determination and just sells himself out every play. He goes 22 for 38 passing for 201 yards, no touchdowns and one interception. He was sacked three times, hit 13 times, 13 quarterback hits. Now, usually you want to keep that number to seven or below. We almost doubled that. Six rushes for 21 yards, so that's another six hits unless he ran out of bounds. But the guy, he had no time to throw the ball. We were no match for this defensive line. Now, what made it even worse is Trent Brown. He he didn't even come out for warm-ups. His shoulder issue started acting up, and he was inactive. And, and that hurt us. And then we even lost Joe Staley for one play. Luckily, it was a knee issue, and he was fine. But this was a huge issue. Our offensive line got destroyed. Namely, Lakin Tomlinson was absolutely manhandled by Sheldon Richardson. And even whenever we had our center come over to kind of help out, it didn't matter. And it was just, we were getting drilled. Our entire offense is predicated on setting up the run for play action pass. And we were doing play action pass and he was getting hit, CJ, before he was even turning around to square up. And you just can't be successful in that. Now, I mean, you could say, one, that's play calling, um, two, it's offensive line, or three, you know, the quarterback's got to check out of that. And, you know, whatever it is, you put the blame on all three of those, it just was a very difficult time. Now, the few times that he got time to set his feet and make it to his first or second read, he was wonderful. He looked amazing in the two-minute drill at the end of both halves. He's a hurry-up kind of guy, which is wonderful. But he, he gets hurt with one minute left in the fourth quarter. He's driving us all the way down the field. It looks like we're about to score. And freaking, ugh, I get so mad. Michael Bennett jumps off sides. And the ref shouldn't have blown it dead. Um, but we have a terrible right tackle because Trent Brown's out. And he, he gets a hit in on C.J. Bethard and hurts his knee. And it didn't look good. I, I, I Hopefully it's just a sprain. There's a good chance he might not play the rest of this year. Um, we will see. Still waiting to hear a word on that. That's completely speculation, but it looked bad. And so he leaves the game with one minute. And I understand the 49ers fans' excitement because, uh, you know, I'm excited too because I want to see Jimmy Garoppolo get in there and see what he can do. He's got one minute left. We're on like the 20. He comes in. He scores an amazing drive, and we'll talk about that. But the problem was, as our starting quarterback that got his ass beat all game and stood in the pocket over and over and over again, just kept taking these hits for our team is down. All the fans start cheering. You, you heard a couple of players get upset, and I understand being happy and cheer for. However, you just need to wait for your quarterback to get off the ground before you start cheering at home. That's just unhealthy. You, you just got to learn. It's just part of it, but it, it's what it is. They'll be talking about it on Twitter and everything for weeks in Sports Center. Um, we'll see. But anyway, so that happened. So Jimmy Garoppolo comes in late in the fourth quarter. The game's already well out of hand, about a minute left. It's third and five. We're on about the 20. He scrambles for five yards for the first down, but he slides feet first, which means when you do that, the ball stops automatically as soon as you begin your slide. So instead of first and goal, it's third and one. Then we have a false start. Then we have an incomplete, or not incomplete pass. We run like a little uh, check down. We get to the line quick, quick, quick. He was going to spike it, but it was fourth down. He made an awesome play. The line gave him great protection. They basically dropped into a seven-man soft zone, and he made it to his fourth read. And, And if you go back to my Jimmy Garoppolo episode, and you can go look on Twitter, JL underscore Chapman. I break down a whole bunch of his film. I make compilations of every single thing that he done and does and every play that he's had. But here's what's special about him is he progresses through reads better or as good as any quarterback in the NFL. It's just who he is and what he does. And on this play, it was kind of like he scrambled outside of the pocket, reset his feet, and you see his eyes and his feet get to his fourth read. Makes an amazing throw for the touchdown. It was absolutely wonderful. Game's over. We end with a little bit of happiness. You know, something positive moving forward. The touchdown catch was made by Lewis Murphy, who we just picked up a week ago. Um, But anyway... So it is, seems like it is officially Jimmy Garoppolo time. So he's going to have the remainder of the season 
to go forward. We've got five games and to see what he can do. Now, I hope and pray we get Trent Brown back. I I cannot stress his value enough. I I really do think he's one of the top three most influential 49ers moving forward. I think him, DeForest Buckner, and Jimmy Garoppolo are key to our success for the future. So, uh, now a couple things just about Jimmy Garoppolo's brief entrance. He had a Perfect (laughs) two-for-two. He had a 100 um, quarterback rating, which is amazing. Absolutely perfect. So just things. Now, that's QBR based on ESPN. Um, Some people spoke up on YouTube and Twitter saying, you know, last week I said he had this uh, quarterback rating, but technically it was this. There's two different numbers out there. There's the ESPN one, which I like the most. is based zero off 100. Then there's a quarterback rating, which is the old NFL way. It goes one to like 146 which he was 142, I believe. So anyway, he played perfectly for the few snaps he was in there. Now, Carlos Hyde, gosh, what a rough game. He had zero room to run. 16 rushes for only 47 yards, but he had seven catches. And a lot of those came that last drive when we were kind of in the two-minute hurry up. But he dropped some passes big time. He had three easy drops on third down. Two of them would have went for a first down. Uh, one of them would not have. But he he left a lot on the field, but not due to effort. He he his thing is he's trying too hard. They're just simple passes right over the middle, and you'll see his head turn because he's you know all about effort and all about getting every little bit he can. He's got to slow down and just be a little bit more disciplined on that. But he ran so hard, it's just there was not a lot. Here, and this is the thing that pisses me off about our play calling. We're playing against a team that just lost two perennial All Pro players in the secondary corners and safeties and so you would think that we would challenge the corners we didn't challenge the corners at all we attacked in the middle of the field against probably one of the greatest safeties to play the game at least top five earl thomas is amazing and that we were choosing to attack him and the linebackers i don't understand why we did not attack the perimeter where they were playing with backup cornerbacks we just i don't understand it. it 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 really pissed me off Anyway, Kittle didn't get much playing time. I don't know what was up that. He came in late in the fourth. He had one catch on two targets for 14 yards, but he, he didn't get a lot of playing time. Trent Taylor, oh man, he showed up early. He had two catches for 35 yards and on three targets, and he took some hits. Now, the one interception was definitely not CJ's fault. Hit him in the hands. Trent Taylor just had the ball taken away. Uh, plain and simple. They just He just took the ball away from him, and they went and turned that into points. Our turnover that we caused, we didn't do anything with it. Breda came in a couple plays. And I'll tell you this. This kid is smooth. He wastes zero movement. He is 100% a north-south runner that does not slow down his speed. He provides little bitty jukes, but that's about it. He is not a guy that's going to stop his speed. He is an absolute baller. I'm really excited to see what he's going to do for the future for the 49ers because he doesn't need a lot of snaps to be effective. So really excited to see what he can do. And I'm going to end on a bad note for the offense. This was the worst offensive line performance that we have had all year. And obviously, I I guess you could say that's going to happen whenever you don't have Trent Brown and you're playing against one of the better defensive line fronts in the NFL. But we just could not get protection or movement on the offensive line. Uh, They were, man, they, they totally owned us. And having Magnuson on the right tackle, that's just a bad idea. Next to Fusco, I mean, you just can't have four weaknesses on an offensive line and expect good things to come. Once you have those bookend tackles in place, everything changes. And whenever you lose one of those, we saw this when Joe Staley was out for a game as well. It totally just destroys all of the function between your offense. So that's the offense. Not too happy with it. Now let's talk to the defense. Oh my gosh. The defense played absolute lights out, completely winnable game because of the performance that they had. Great in the first half. We only gave up 129 yards offense in the first half, and the only points that they scored in the first half was was the seven points off the interception, which they had great field position. You you can't put that on the defense. Now, we gave up, and here's the thing. You, You cannot have a game where you have zero sacks and win. You don't win those games. Last year, the top um, of the top 10 teams with the most sacks, all 10 of them were in the playoffs. All 10 of them were. Like, it, it's a correlation because it stops drives. 
we have not gotten pressure. Now, what's weird, though, with this game is we actually did get pressure, but we had four missed sacks. Four of them. Uh, Russell Wilson, I get it. He can scramble really, really well, but our guys are 300-pounders, damn it. And if you're Solomon Thomas, you got to wrap them up and bring them to the ground because on two of those drives that they scored, those drives would have been done if he just would have wrapped up Russell Wilson. So that's part of where we're at. And, and another issue we have, we suck at defensive end outside contain. We, <laughs> I don't understand. We run the exact same defensive scheme as Seattle, but what they were good at, we were bad at. Their defensive line, especially the ends, are very, very strict on outside contain and not letting the boot get outside. We are terrible at that exact same thing. Now, Reuben Foster, he's Reuben Foster. He balled out. He had six tackles and one tackle for loss. Um, but our MVP this week goes to Eric Reed. Holy cow, he played great. First play from scrimmage is an interception. He uh, shadowed Jimmy Graham. And anytime he was on Jimmy Graham, he shut him down. Whenever we motioned him out of coverage or weren't in man coverage and Eric Reed didn't have him, he killed us. So absolutely great game by Eric Reed. Seven tackles in the interception. And, man, he even stopped. There was a play where it was like third and seven. And Russell Wilson starts scrambling. It looks like he's got the first down no matter what. And Eric Reed comes out of nowhere, drags him down one yard short, and forces a punt. Absolutely amazing. Eric Reed just played amazing. Now, Reuben Foster played great in the first half. The second half seemed like something was wrong. Not that he was injured. He wasn't limping or anything like that. And he still played pretty well. He just didn't seem to play with that pissed off, pants on fire attitude where he's out there trying to hurt people. I don't know. It just seemed like he was a little hesitant. So I'm curious to see what's going on there. DeForest Buckner, lots of pressure the entire night, but missed a couple sacks just because he'd get his hands on Wilson. But I, I don't know what it is. We just couldn't bring that guy down. Solomon Thomas could have been the MVP if he uh, just would have got the sacks that he missed. He, he had three additional hits on the quarterback, so he was playing in the background. But if we go back to when we drafted him, again, this is in my scouting profile of him before we drafted him. He is much more of a disruptor than a sack artist. Um, he, he flies in out of control, full speed, and gets his hands on the quarterback, but very seldom brings him down. But he does play on the correct side of the line. He is always penetrating, which is great, and, and there's a lot of potential there. But we've got to get this guy. I don't know what it is. He's got to be able to make the actual sacks because if he can do that, I mean, it's going to be endless with this guy. The potential's through the roof. Akilo Witherspoon, some of the best absolutely amazing plays and some of the worst absolutely terrifying plays all in the same game and that again this is Akilah Witherspoon is the microcosm of what the 49ers roster is we are young and talented with a lot of potential and flash plays but very inconsistent and so for example it's third and 10 in the first quarter he gives a nine yard cushion and one-on-one -on -one coverage on the outside and gets beat by a simple 10-yard out for a first down. Whenever the pass was caught for the first down, he was five yards away from the receiver. Now, I understand we're running a cover three concept, but you got to know where the chains are. And, and you can't be that shy and that timid. Now, then he, he backs that up, and he has an amazing coverage play where he almost got an interception, but it was wiped out by a penalty on Eric Reed. Okay, then he goes back. Has a terrible coverage. One-on-one -on -one with Jimmy Graham on the end zone. Now you're thinking fade. You can see he was thinking fade because as soon as they snapped the ball, he started backpedaling out of his stance, flat-footed. And he gets beat by a slant with five-yard cushion on the one-yard line. That makes zero sense. Then he goes back. Makes one of the best plays I have seen all year by a cornerback. Plays perfect trail technique. Deep ball in the end zone. Trails, trails, trails. Once he gets close enough to touch the wide receiver, he looks back, gets his hand up, bats the ball away. I mean, textbook coverage. So there's glimpses here. We just got to get this kid on a consistent basis, and I, I don't think there's a doubt that he can be our number one corner moving forward. He just has to. He's a, he's a little bit of a head case, which is scary with DBs because whenever they're like that, it can go really, really good for a while, then really, really bad. So let's just see what happens. Kerwin Williams made a couple very, very good plays. Uh, absolutely love this guy. Blew up a screen for negative four yards. Um, just attacks. The kid plays so tough. 
Dante Johnson, oh man, there is something that's going on. <laughs> I, I guarantee you the Giants offensive coordinator <laughs> called up the Seahawks offensive coordinator and says, hey, just attack this guy, number 36. They picked on him all night. Wherever he lined up, that was the primary read, and they just peppered him in targets, and it didn't go too well. Now, the one awesome play that he made against Doug Baldwin in the end zone to break up the play, they call a freaking ridiculous pass interference penalty. Cost us a touchdown. It was a huge play. And it's funny, they pan over to Kyle Shanahan on the sidelines, and you see him just screaming at the ref saying, are you effing kidding me? I mean, it was absolutely just terrible call. But it was a veteran move by Doug Baldwin. Um, He hooked him with the back to the... (laughs) Doug Baldwin hooked the defender, Dante Johnson, with his back to the ref and pulled both of them down, then held his hands up. And so, yeah, he, he, I don't know. He, he, got, he got a vet move, and it worked. Tank Carradine came back off the IR. It was wonderful. And he made two amazing moves where he owned Dwayne Brown, who's a Pro Bowl left tackle that they just traded for, but both times missed the sack. <laughs> Basically made a perfect textbook move. Uh, <laughs> Going straight towards the quarterback and just whiffed both times. Also, Blue contained three different times for huge gains by the offense. All three of those went for first downs. Ronald Blair continues to show out. And for some reason, we had Ronald Blair one-on-one with Jimmy Graham 30 yards downfield. Yeah, guess how that worked out? Eh, not well. I understand zone coverage drops. I get it. But in a cover three scheme, you don't need your defensive ends dropping 30 yards downfield. You don't drop them into man. You don't do that. There's something wrong with your scheme. That means you're getting out coached. We need to fix that. Uh, Cassius Marsh, his first, uh, he's back against his former team. He played great. Absolutely great run defender on the edge and can play Sam Backer. And probably the biggest weakness of our defense. Oh, big surprise. What position? Free safety. Gosh, man. I, Adrian Colbert, I went back and watched the film quite a bit, and he totally showed out last week. Now, he broke his hand in the first quarter of last week and continued to play through it and was absolutely exceptional, almost my MVP on the defensive side. But he didn't get to play this week. He had to have surgery, but we should have him next week. And, man, we need it because we looked awful. We had Leon Hall and Exum Jr. back there, and they just were terrible. It, it was an absolute... It was just rough. We're doing patchwork defense right now, and that's got to change. Now, special teams, top-notch as always. Robbie Gold, God, that guy is so good. He he might be the MVP of our season, to be honest with you. Now, a couple random notes. Turnovers, uh, one-to-one. So we typed the turnover thing, but here's the deal. It's not just about turnovers. You have to turn those into points. Their interception, they turned into a touchdown. Ours, we punted away. Now, penalties, guess what? The two most penalized team in the entire NFL square off, and we get more penalties than them. We double them in yardage. We have seven penalties for 74 yards. They have six penalties for 35. Now, injuries, we've talked about Trent Brown. Hopefully, he's a go next week. Adrian Colbert with his hand is a go next week. He's already said. Marquise Goodwin, he limped off to the locker room but came back and made a couple big plays. Again, my offensive MVP. Kilo Witherspoon, exact same thing, limped off. In the middle of a play, came back the next series, so he seems to be okay. Joe Staley, man, his knee injury looked bad. He grabbed the back of his knee, which is never, never good, but he only missed one play. That guy is as tough as they get, and I cannot stress this enough. Best offensive lineman in 49ers history. CJ Beathard, don't know how long he's going to be out. This is kind of the big one. He was grabbing his knee um, high shin area. Best case scenario, you're talking high ankle sprain which is looking at a four to six week. He's going to be done for the season, but usually no lasting damage. It's a soft, it's a ligament issue is what it is. Hopefully it's not an ACL, MCL, or anything like that that would cost him the off season. Um, So just kind of hang tight, pay attention. Let's see what happens there. And then Raheem uh, Mostert, he, he hurt his knee as well on a special teams play, and he has been our special teams freaking stud like he's probably going to be named to the pro bowl as a special team specialist because he has just shown out at all times so that's this week in a nutshell it is jimmy g looking forward 49er fans we're going to get to see what we got and if he can keep doing whatever he's doing two for two for 18 yards and a touchdown and a perfect passer rating i'm totally okay with that now next week 
We had three home games in a row. Now we're on the road to cold Chicago, the 3-8 and eight Chicago Bears. It is early kickoff, and we are four-point underdogs on the road. Now, usually what you got to do is you give the home team three points. It's kind of what Vegas does. And then after that, they address accordingly. So basically, they see the Chicago Bears as being a point better than us. And even more fun for us, our former defensive coordinator, Vic Fangio, during the hardball times, is their defensive coordinator. So very curious to see how it's going to be with him playing against his former team. That defense is legit. Uh, The Chicago Bears' defense is actually pretty solid. Their offense is just completely inept. So I expect a very low-scoring game. But hey, man, let's see what happens. And stay strong, faithful. If you got any questions, hit me up on Twitter, JL underscore Chapman. And also go check a look at uh, FullPressCoverage.com. It's going to be a legit uh, site where I'm going to have a lot of content coming out on there. So stay tuned and stay strong, faithful. Talk to you later.